Concurrent with the emergence of the global crisis of climate change, the metaphor of the carbon footprint has surfaced in Western discourse as a key social mark and measure of a troubled relationship between people and the biosphere. Emerging in 2005 as a younger sibling metaphor of the ecological footprint coined in 1992 by Mathis Wackernagel and William Rees, but itself having no single author or source, the metaphor of the carbon footprint has rapidly become naturalized as a figure of climate change consciousness, presumably inciting measurements and actions that will reduce negative human impacts on the atmosphere. A key sign of the popularization of this consciousness is the pocket idiot's guide to your carbon footprint assertion that the size of your carbon footprint may become one of the most important numbers in your life in the 21st century. Although some research has focused on quantitatively defining the carbon footprint as an exact measure of greenhouse gases released in the acts of human production and consumption, the competing cultural, political and material effects of these metaphors have not yet received critical attention. I claim that we ignore the effects of carbon footprint metaphors at the expense of fuller understandings of how climate change, its causes and effects, are in part culturally and politically constituted. Clearly the pervasiveness of carbon footprint metaphors suggests that they hold a special appeal and powerfully knit together consequential cultural discourses of climate change. These metaphors have become so culturally pervasive over the past decade that they have been naturalized and stripped of their metaphoricity, significantly escaping critical attention as constitutive elements in the cultural politics of climate change. My claim is that there is something about metaphor, specifically ecological metaphor, that makes carbon footprint met uh, figures so powerful and yet at the same time allows them to slip below the radar. Foregrounding the critical political and ecological effects of these metaphors, their world-making capacity is the goal of my project. My paper explores how carbon footprint metaphors, as they orient responses to climate change, function as technologies of Foucauldian biopower, that is, as means through which humans as a species enter into history as a population to be administered and managed. As Michel Foucault defines it, biopower is a form of power invested in quote, the fundamental biological fact that human beings are a species. Taking Foucault's words further, I propose that within current contexts of climate change, it is as a carbon species that humans are being addressed and biopolitically managed. The concept of biopower, when applied to examples of the carbon footprint in popular dis discourse, suggests a critical interrogation into who is the f footprint maker or the kind of ecological subject that is called into view through the carbon footprint metaphor, and what kinds of ecological politics is this subject invited to practice. Taking seriously the effect of carbon footprint metaphors firstly involves understanding the animating force that metaphors exert in the world. A recent interdisciplinary field of metaphor studies incorporates a variety of approaches including those from cognitive linguistics, which begin with the claim that metaphor originates in the human brain as a cognitive short circuit, to the constructivists, which claim that metaphor is socially produced. Whether one takes the starting premise of biological human or socially constructed human, however, theories of metaphor crucially share certain premises. Primarily, they both insist that metaphor is pervasive and inescapable. Following the foundational groundwork of cognitive linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, Sradko Radman asserts, quote, We do not metaphorize because we irresistibly enjoy figurative language claims, but because we actually cannot do otherwise. Echoing this view, post-structuralist and feminist science studies discourses like Donna Haraway contend that a literal or objective language free of metaphor is, in fact, an impossibility. Lakoff and Johnson reveal that the ways in which we reduce complexity through metaphors are determined by our basic human experiences, shaped by both physical and cultural interactions. Paradoxically, however, metaphor reduces complexity through the creative act of carrying over seemingly unrelated notions. Indeed, metaphor in Greek means carrying over, a very suggestively active relationship. For those interested in ecological materialities at a time of seemingly proliferating crises, ecological metaphor constitutes a key locus of intervention. While I'm aware that ecology itself may be used metaphorically to, to describe relations in corporations, organizations and networks of all kinds, I'm using the notion ecological metaphor to highlight the kind of metaphor that more explicitly orients human thoughts, behaviors, feelings and actions vis-a-vis -vis the living world conceived not solely in human terms.
An analysis of, this, of these metaphors requires focusing on what is carried with them and the ways in which complexity is reduced, with a critical eye on the material and political arrangements that they enable. Although literary treatments of metaphor tend to focus on its creative and imaginary work, poets also understand the material resonances of this effective work. Poet Archibald MacLeish poetically hypothesi hypothesizes that, quote, a world ends when it meta its metaphor has died, end quote, gesturing at a profound connection between the imaginary and the real through a kind of culturally shared common sense. The kind of common sense I am evoking here is not only cognitive, but also affective, that is to say it involves feelings, and biopolitical in the way that it organizes individuals' and species' responses. From this perspective, carbon footprint metaphors may be approached as affect-producing and world-creating technologies whose popular appeal arguably has more to do with the way they excite feeling in common than how they empirically calculate carbon. The emergence of a specific historic carbon species at this time entails the appearance of new feelings and politics that may fall under the rubric of what Nela Koteko calls carbon compounds phrases including carbon, thus compounds conceived as linguistic bonds rather than chemical ones. My larger project toggles between the politics and poetics of the carbon footprint using conventional terms of political theory, subjectivity, citizenship and activism, and theories of affect in terms of feelings including guilt and fellowship. I do not claim to be able to read or definitively ascertain how subjects may feel, but rather to talk about the kinds of feelings that uses of the metaphor appear to be trying to generate in discourse. Here I will only briefly touch upon something I call carbon subjectivity and its poetic affinities with carbon guilt. The term subjectivity is a complex and contested term in politics and philosophy, but very simply stated, I am evoking a way of theorizing processes by which individuals become recognizable selves within socio-political historical orders. I am arguing that the carbon footprint metaphor helps to newly assert carbon selves or carbon subjects in emerging Western socio-political orders at a time of climate change. One example of this is found in a book by Joanna Yarrow, quoted on the screen. Newly hailed by atmospheric conditions, carbon footprint makers as carbon subjects answer the call to respond in the name of global species survival. Key sets of practices and discourses allow carbon subjects to appear through footprint metaphors. One of the most salient illustrations of this is the now familiar list that enumerates ways subjects can reduce their carbon foot footprints, often beginning with change the light bulbs. Carbon subjectivity surfaces alongside understandings of anthropogenic climate change as carbon takes on new elemental signi significance as an index of intelligibility for the individuals and populations who, through unbridled fossil fuel combustion, have unintentionally created the atmospheric conditions leading to the crisis of climate change. Most certainly, this form of subjectivity newly demonstrates the carbon subjectedness that limits notions of individual freedom in a dominant Western as imaginary that only recently has appreciated the precise carbon calibration that makes possible our and many other species. Notably, however, other subject-oriented considerations such as saving money and savings one, saving one's lifestyle are brought to bear in calls to reduce footprints. Using Foucault's understanding of how individual subjects emerge as effects of biopower, I am tracing the emergence of carbon subjects and thinking through the stories we tell ourselves as we formulate responses as good carbon footprint reducers that reinforce this kind of carbon consciousness. What impulses guide such responses and behaviors, and how might they be caught up in pre-existing frames of behavior that actually further entrench the crisis of climate change? I argue that many of the marketized and domesticated responses to reducing one's carbon footprint, for example the suggestions in my own provincial government's document, uh, 52 ways you can reduce your f carbon footprint to buy an electric leaf blower instead of a gas powered one, expose the limits of dominant forms of carbon subjectivity as elicited by footprint metaphors. Although I do not wish to entirely write off all of the behaviors that are incited by the footprint metaphor, I do aim to highlight the limits of the many mechanisms through which carbon subjects can feel good, or at least feel less guilty. Through these mechanisms, larger frames of fellow feelings, or shared membership in a common, disproportionately divided world, succumb to individualized, subject-centered feelings. One of the ways carbon footprint metaphors function biopolitically 
is by exciting what may be called neoliberal carbon guilt. One notable website, savingspecies.org, explicitly addresses this feeling of guilt in the quote on the screen. While the term carbon guilt has gained currency in the past few years, little attempt has been made to theorize for whom these feelings are most prescient and the effects of these socially transmitted feelings, nor the complicity of dominant carbon metaphors in generating this feeling. Carbon guilt, I argue, is intimately linked to a dominant form of carbon subjectivity. The subjects susceptible to carbon guilt are generally homeowners in the developed world with fossil fuel intensive lifestyles, that is subjects whose practices of consumption are obviously implicated in the crisis of climate change. While clearly not all of the fault falls on the shoulders of these individual carbon subjects, but rather accrues more systemically to broader social and economic orders, the feelings of carbon guilt engendered by the calculation of one's footprint are often intensely individualized and domesticated inviting personal atonement from carbon subjects on an atomic or household level. A key effect of this individualization of the carbon footprint metaphor is the marketization of ecological practice. One of the central ways that affluent carbon footprint makers can allay guilt is through the purchase of carbon offsets within a newly established carbon market. In an economy reminiscent of certain Catholic practices during the Middle Ages where indulgences or pardons for sins were bought and sold, carbon offset purchases enable guilty subjects to emit greenhouse gases as usual, but to buy their way out of the sinful subjectivity such consumption now signifies. Practices of the airline industry are examples of this. Offsets are legitimated through a growing number of carbon management companies who evoke the carbon footprint metaphor which serves as a technology of biopower to affectively manage the carbon subjects who buy into these practices. While I do not wish to dismiss wholesale all of the clean development mechanisms that have been initiated since carbon has been commodified, there is sufficient reason to be skeptical of the long-term effectiveness of this kind of solution. Theorizing an affective economy in which the carbon footprint serves to excite individual guilt, only for such guilt to serve market mechanisms that work to ab absolve it, prompts examination of the limits of the metaphor inasmuch as it firstly allows ecological subjects to evade collective and more politicized action, and more importantly permits permit political institutions like nation states and transnational corporations to indefinitely defer political responses to climate change by inviting subjects to shoulder the burden. My research does not claim to exhaustively theorize all of the potential feelings generated on biopolitical dimensions of these metaphors, but takes up specific examples to show how these metaphors can be affectively and politically troubled. Because carbon footprint metaphors have become so naturalized, my aim is to defamiliarize their currency by examining the power of metaphor to orient human action and political responses. Seen from this angle, these metaphors function neither simply as communicative tools that can be picked from among many such tools, nor as quantitative metrics that can neutrally assess ecological impacts, but as technologies of biopower that cognitively, effectively, and culturally orient responses toward climate change. Thus my goal is to draw attention to the urgent practical implications of theorizing relations between metaphor and power in the early 21st century. Many carbon footprint metaphors are so tightly interwoven with the dominant comp compound of carbon economy that I wonder if they can be inflected productively away from solely marketized solutions. There is an instance in which the carbon footprint metaphor is evoked to demonstrate a connection between wealth of nations and responsibility for emissions in a report by the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, but such instances are marginal in the wider discourse of carbon footprint metaphors. I claim that understanding what Radman calls the world-making function of metaphors reveals the importance of examining and cultivating diverse ecological metaphors that matter the world differently. This is a productive and hopeful site where pol politics and poetics conjoin. Thank you. I appreciatively welcome any comments.